Welcome to Takeshi's Bench, where you can discuss all things philosophical. This is my first Q&A episode where I like to introduce viewers' questions and respond to these questions as a philosopher. Now, before getting into these questions, I'd like to respond to a general question that I usually receive as a philosopher. Many people have asked me, okay, besides teaching classes and reading books and grading papers, what do you actually do as a philosopher? They're just curious about the content of our, our work. Um, usually, philosophers are busy working on their projects besides taking care of these academic responsibilities. So, for instance, they would run a certain funded projects run by the department or run by the state, or they have their own personal philosophical projects that are interesting to them. It is true that most of the time, most philosophy professors and instructors are spending more time in teaching and lecturing and grading papers, so on and so forth. But they are also running many intellectual projects on the side. Just to give you an example, I'd like to tell you that I'm actually working on a single project right now. I'm reading this book called Nietzsche and Other Buddhas Philosophy After Comparative Philosophy, written by Jason Wirth, published really recently, 2019, at the Indiana University Press. This is basically a project that came to me from this journal called Philosophy East and West. A friend of mine was asked to write a critical review of this book for Philosophy East and West, uh, which is published by University of Hawaii Press since 1951. Basically, they asked me, would you like to contribute the critical review of this book in conjunction with other critics? So this is a kind of the project that came from outside, different projects that I'm working on. Jason Worth is the president of the Comparative and Continental Philosophy Circle in the United States. He's been working on many interesting comparative philosophical works, including Chinese and Japanese philosophy, in conjunction with the continental philosophical tradition. So what is critical review? So you might heard this term book review. Book review is a very short review of a book, or sometimes you read movie review, right? Basically, if you write, let's say, 500 to 1,000 words on what do you like about this book, and you recommend this book to the academic audience. So that is called book review. Critical review is one step above the book review in a sense that you have to write up to 4,000, 5,000, sometimes even 6,000 words to describe the pros and cons of reading this book. So you would have to actually step deeper into the structure of the book and decipher what is good and what is bad about it and provide critique to the author. And usually critical reviews are done by a group of scholars. So you have four or five scholars writing the critical reviews on a single book, and these reviews will be sent to the author. And the author will construct between 4,000 and 8,000 words reply to these objections. So there's a kind of dialogue between critics and the author. That is called critical review practice in academia. So currently I'm working on the critical review of Nietzsche and other Buddhas. Uh, that takes usually about a week. It depends on how fast you can read a book and how many times you, you have to read before you start writing uh, these reviews. For me, I have to read a couple times. So it takes one weekend to maybe a week for me to read a book. And then it takes another week or two for me to write critical review. I'm not really a fast reader or a fast writer in that regard. Uh, so it takes a couple weeks for me to work on this project. That is something that is keeping me busy besides working on next YouTube clips on Chinese and Japanese philosophy. So let me introduce the actual questions that I received over the last couple months. Our first question is given by Irene from Lausanne, Switzerland. She asked me this question, in which years did the decentralized study of multiple intellectual traditions become visible in publications? Remember the first episode where I talk about the decentralized study of multiple intellectual traditions is, is a kind of recent development in the field of world philosophies, even though earlier type of this decentralized study of multiple intellectual traditions started with comparative philosophy. So that's the first question from Irene. The second question is given by Jan from Antwerp in Belgium. He asked me this question through email. When a student or researcher like yourself gets on to doing research, how does that process look like? From posing a question to writing a paper, what steps do you take? I might have answered a part of this question in the beginning of this episode, but I would like to give you a little bit different descriptions. But first, let's respond to Irene's question. So when did the publications of the world philosophy become visible in academia and beyond? 
Now, I incidentally introduced this journal, Philosophy East and West, University of Hawaii Press. It's been publishing this journal since 1951. So if we are historian, when did the first publications of comparative philosophy took place or philosophy that compares beyond the confines of European philosophical traditions? I think this journal is the best place to look at. It started in 1951. Interestingly, though, world philosophy specialists would criticize comparative philosophy as anchoring the framework of their philosophy into the Anglo-European philosophical tradition, right? Remember that? But I'm, I'm going to say not everything in comparative philosophy is something that world philosophy specialists would critique. So some of them are actually synonymous. The ways in which you're comparing European and, let's say, Chinese philosophical tradition could be Eurocentric or could be a great comparison that heightens the strength and the weakness of two intellectual traditions, something like that, okay? So let's say in 1951, Philosophy East and West started to publish articles on decentralized study of multiple intellectual traditions, right? But interesting thing is that this very famous philosopher, his name is Thorsten Bots bornstein This guy, to me, is the incarnation of the comparative philosophy spirit. I think he does many interesting comparative philosophical works that ranges from one intellectual tradition to another, one topic to another. He has written on many things about uh, architecture, movies, Japanese philosophy, Russian philosophy. To me, he is the intellectual figure that works on comparative philosophical field, and many of his publications are actually palpable to the world philosophy's specialist perspective, okay? This is actually the picture of Thorsten from his website. And you can go to his website to see how many different books he has written in relation to the field of philosophy. But Thorsten says something really interesting about philosophy in the East and West at the a conference once. He said, philosophy in the East and West started to talk about comparison of Eastern and Western philosophical traditions. But up until 1970s, everybody had to actually give some kind of methodological justification for why we are comparing multiple intellectual traditions or why we are going beyond the confines of a European intellectual tradition. Thorsten says that from 1970 onwards, we stopped actually justifying. So in some ways, 1970s is a time in which it was more or less acceptable to compare multiple intellectual traditions in reference to the philosophy East and West. But again, in general context of philosophy, as I mentioned in the first episode, non-Western philosophical tradition is much, much less studied in the field of philosophy. So this is a very specific case where you can say that the publications on comparative philosophy took place from mid-20th century, and then by the end of 20th century, it became more acceptable to academics. But this does not represent the fact that world philosophy publications were available from mid-20th century. But anyway, I would place a link to Thorsten's website and you'll be able to actually check out his books and which publishers are sponsoring his decentralized approach to the world intellectual traditions. Other publishers that I would mention to Irene would be first one is Indiana University Press. So the book that I mentioned in the beginning Nietzsche and other Buddha comes from this series of world philosophies from Indiana University Press. Now, the link to this series is not functioning properly. That is to say, it is not showing the comprehensive list of all the publications they have done in the series. So I have to talk to the publisher to fix this link. But this is one of the series where you'll be able to find the books on world philosophies. Another one is Bloomsbury Introduction to World Philosophies. They haven't published any books yet. I think they are going to publish at least five to ten books that I know of at the end of this year or beginning of next year. So they're going to make a huge splash in relation to the field of world philosophies. And as you can see, I'm actually involved with this book series as a regional editor. This series is going to provide you the text that introduces thinkers from non-Western philosophical traditions. They are intending to publish a series of books that introduce thinkers and schools or themes from non-European philosophical traditions. They are designed to be used at the undergraduate courses. So uh, you'll be able to actually pick up one of the book and read essays on what they actually thought about the world and themselves according to different intellectual traditions. And some of the text would include translations. So you'll be able to actually read the translation excerpts as you familiarize yourself with the themes and ideas from non-European intellectual traditions. So these are the two series that came to my mind immediately when I was thinking about responding to Irene's questions. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are more than this. And uh, as they come to me, I would like to introduce them in this channel.
So to the second question given by Jan from Antwerp, so how does that process of doing research look like and how do we move from posing questions to writing papers in academia? And what kind of steps do we actually take in relation to these processes? Um, that's a really good question. I think most students would have to respond to the questions that are made by the professors. In fact, in philosophy, it's more difficult to come up with a decent question that would lead to a series of significant questions, so sub-questions, and also a significant answers that lead to a great insight. So uh, undergraduate courses on philosophy, I think most of the students are expected to answer the questions raised by professors. And once students become familiar with the process of coming up with the good questions in relation to their process of reading books, they will be able to come up with their own questions. So for instance, if you're going to write a BA thesis, it's often the case that you have to come up with a question and send it to the professor and then you have to get approval in order to come up with that thesis. Researchers uh, or professors, how do we actually do our research and how do we come up with these questions? That's very difficult to answer in, in one sense. There are common procedures. I think most professors read books, insane amount of books. And also they, you know, listen to the music, they watch movies and they go for a walk or they are engaging in any kind of artistic activities or even athletic activities somewhere in their brain or mind that actually reserved for philosophy. So even if you go for a walk in Tokyo and see these cherry blossoms in Japan, and I think somewhere in us that we are still working on some kind of passage, or we are thinking, what's the best way to answer that question? But the way in which we come up with a specific project could come from, let's say some department comes up with the project. So the group of researchers come up with the project or your student is going to come up with the project and you have to be part of that research group. So you don't really decide what topic that you're going to work on. Uh, sometimes PhD positions is opened by specific project funding. So the group of professors came up with the project and then the state provides that department of funding to hire a PhD student. So when you apply, you already have to comply to a certain framework of questions. Or sometimes if you're a public intellectual or senior professors with less committee and teaching requirements or researchers that have a time for doing research, they do have time to come up with their own questions. So they are reading books, they are talking to friends, they're talking to their colleagues, and they just come up with this, oh, I never actually thought about the problem, but I would like to work on that problem. That would be the ideal situation in which a philosopher would come up with his or her questions. Many times, the questions are actually posed from outside. Uh, so, you know, my case of writing critical review is one of the examples. My colleague published a book and another colleague is running the critical review project on this book. So they come to me and say, could you write a reflection on this book? So you read this book. Ideal world, right? You come up with the questions that's so profound that you'll be able to write a single book. And then you collect the books, let's say between 30 to 100 books on that topic. And then you read all these books and you decipher which references that they cite are relevant to your topic. And you also read their book. So let's say you read between 100 to 300, 500 entries on a specific project. After reading all these, you'll be able to actually start writing the book and you don't have any writer's block and you'll be able to write the whole thing within half a year and you write a book. That's the ideal world that many philosophy professors and researchers would like to get into. But I think the situation is sometimes different. You write one chapter for one project and you write another chapter for another project and then suddenly you started to see the link and then you'll be able to construct the whole book. Or I've also heard about different procedures as well. For instance, I read this tweet by uh, Morioka Masahiro, a Japanese philosopher from Waseda University in Tokyo. He said, once he comes up with a question, he starts to read in books. And then toward the end of his writing, he reads more books. That's very interesting to me because many people tend to read more in the beginning than they feel that they are ready to start writing. But Morioka Masahiro is saying that he actually reads as he writes. I think I'm much closer to his style in the sense that oftentimes when I start writing something, instead of having the entire structure and an answer to the question in my mind, I tend to evolve into one direction or another. And I think the Thorsten Botz-Bornstein that I mentioned in answer to Irene's question is also the same. I think Thorsten's process of writing is so organic, as he calls it, that sometimes it evolves in one direction and sometimes stops there, then he works on another project, kind of flourishes in different branches of knowledge. So there are differences among the different researchers, and I don't think there's a single right way to do research. 
But I have to say, I think the end product look quite the same, right? Each book contains references to many books. There are many different reasons why they bought these books, right? So some of them actually bought all these books before start writing, or they started to buy or build their library as they worked on this book project. But you'll be able to see every single probably philosophy professor's desk or bookshelf will be packed with the books that I read in the process of their writing, uh, whether or not this library is a physical library or virtual library. I'm not sure I'm representing the, uh, the, the population of philosophers in the world very well right now, but that's the best answer I can provide from my end. And I hope you started to be able to visualize how cool the life of philosophers are, and this could stimulate you to read more books. On that note, I'd like to finish this uh, Q&A session. Okay, if you made it this far, you should definitely like this video. And also, if you are interested in philosophy, please subscribe to this channel, Takeshi's Bench. If you have any questions about philosophy or comments, arguments, and ideas on all things philosophical, please send them to us through comments below. We will try to pick some of them for the future episodes. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.